what an introduction. Well, thank you. I have to live up to, uh, to that introduction now. So my name's Paul. Um, I am going to spend two hours with you right before lunch. Tough spot. But the good news is I've got tons of video I'm going to show. So you're going to see lots of video from people. Video is not all great quality. Some of it's shot on Zoom, but the content is gold. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes all up and then you're going to be discussing at your tables and I'm going to challenge you with some questions. So that's, that's our road to lunch. Um, let me introduce myself to give you a little bit of context. So 51, Australian bloke, been an expat for 16 years and just came home to Australia about two years ago. I was in, in Europe um, as a CEO or president, as you're called over there, it's one of those fancy titles, running breweries. So in the Czech Republic and Romania, um, across Europe and things like that too. Um, I'm back in Australia, uh, came home, we were living in Romania, there was a, a war with Ukraine, there is a war, Romania and Ukraine have a border, it just wasn't working for us as a family, so we came home and started our life again here. And Today I'm uh, CEO of a, uh, an animal pharmaceutical company, so we make medicines for vets and farmers. Great Australian uh, business, owned, operated here, we manufacture here. I'm learning, I've gone from beer to animals. Big change, uh, but it's still lots of fun. Depends on how many beers you have. It depends on how many beers you have. I used to be a lot bigger. I've cut that since I've come home. That's come back. But during the pandemic, I, I did two things that changed the trajectory of my life and actually probably led to the room today. So I, um, we were living in, in the Czech Republic during the, the, has anyone been to Prague in the room? Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous place. Lived there for eight years, loved it. And um, we were let out for the summer that first year. And there's no, Prague, Czech is landlocked. So the nearest beach is 14 hours away. So we got in the car and we drove, as you do when you're Australians. And um, I had this moment in, in the city of Dubrovnik where I was talking to my nine-year-old daughter about leadership while she was doing that floss. You remember the floss? <laughs> And I remember saying to her, Paige, it's not about being the star of the show. Sometimes it's about being the person that organises the show. She just rolled her eyes at me. But it sort of got me thinking, what do I actually know about leadership anyway? I'm running a business, but what, you know, what do I know about it? And who are the best leaders I know? It's a 14-hour drive home. And on the way home, I was looking for podcasts because the best leaders I know, or that I've experienced in my life, uh, sports coaches. There's just something about their, they're very stoic, they're very selfless, and there's just something about their humility that's, that impacted me quite strongly. And I'm sure for many of you in the room, if I asked you right now who is a sports coach that's influenced you, you'd be able to answer straight away. In the same way that you could probably answer about a teacher who's influenced you. So anyway, we got home and we're all in lockdown and I thought, I'm going to interview six great sports coaches on the topic of leadership, see what I can learn. And sent off, I think I sent off about 50 requests um, and I got like 45 yeses, <laughs> which was a bit bonkers. So I panicked <laughs> um, and then I started frantically sitting up all night trying to write questions. And what eventuated was I started this podcast called The Great Coaches. It's a hobby. It's not my full-time gig, but it's in the top 2% in the world and Macquarie sponsor it. So I, I, I sent a note out into the world saying, will anyone please sponsor? Because it actually, you actually have to, I don't make tons of money, I don't make really anything out of it, but I need people to do the website and social media and do the editing and stuff. So they get all the, the coin. But what I get out of it is I've met some fascinating individuals along that way. I've met, um, I have met men and women I don't just interview middle-aged white guys. <laughs> I'm the father of two daughters, 18 and 14, and being an expat for so long, diversity is part of who I am. I've worked in countries that don't have English as a first language. I've worked, I spent four years working through Asia, and then the final 12 um, in Europe. I speak a little, a little Chinese, but I, you know, sort of know a little bit about everything. So men, women, uh, para sports and non para sports, um, all different codes. You'll know some of the faces, you'll, you might not know all of them. Um, 
you know, on this list, what have we on up here? We've got Sean Dyche coaches, um, I think he's with Everton at the minute in the Premier League. Uh, that's Ricky Stewart, if there's any league fans. That's Dr. Rick Charlesworth. Thomas Frank coaches Brentford um, in the English Premier League. Jenny Busek was one of the first women to coach in the NBA. So she's, you'll see her a little bit today. Uh, who else have we got? That's Lisa Alexander. She coaches the Australian netball team for a long time. Justin Langer, Pokey Chapman, Eddie Jones. You know. So anyway, we're going to listen to some of these people today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them and their voice to amplify some of the things that I've learned. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. All right? And then I'm going to put it back on you. Say, so how do you think about this? And then at the end, what I've done is, based on all of these interviews, I've created 20 questions that you can answer to measure your leadership style against theirs. And you'll get a little, we'll do it on the spot together. It's very easy to do. And so you'll see how you are as a leader relative to the people that I've interviewed. Doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad. It's just a comparison point for you. Sound okay? Yeah. All right. I'm conscious I've got the pre-lunch slot, remember, so I'm going to be asking you lots of questions. So, look, I'm going to start with the biggest thing I've learnt, um, and then I'm going to break it, I'm going to go one, I'm going to break it into four, and then I'm going to break it further. The biggest thing I've learnt at the ripe old age of 51, <laughs> there's just no algorithm for leadership. There's no black book. If anyone tells you there's a black book, I would really challenge that. There's no cheat sheet. And the problem is, with an out, you could probably type your leadership challenge into chat GPT or a similar tool, but it's so, it's so happening in real time. Today's Saturday. So yesterday at work, I had an incidence where I had two staff members had a, a fight in the corridor, a verbal altercation in the, in the corridor, and one went home crying and the other... Um, fled to the bathroom. The one that went home crying was a 50-year-old male. Then in the afternoon, uh, I found out that the, the auditor that's coming to audit our facility, we have a sterile room, um, has had to delay and so we need to push it back a week or pull it forward a week. The preparation that went into that was intense. And then last thing on the day, I had the owner call me about the last P&L and he wanted to talk about you know, challenges we had on the salary and wages line. You just, there's no time to do chat GPT. You, you, you're talking about things real time and you're moving and you're, you're reflecting on your values and what you stand for each and every moment. You're being watched each and every moment, as, you, as some of you will know too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and unpack it for you as well. The four things I'm going to talk about to unpack that idea of then no algorithm for leadership are these four areas. Because whilst I think there isn't a formula, I think there are some things you can do as soon as you leave this room to help you be a better leader. And my hope is that at the end of this, you'll pick a few of those up and they fall under these four areas. The way you manage people, the way you think about the, the organisation culture, how you approach learning. And the last one is, is key, the way you reflect on your performance as a leader. It is a performance role. You are performing every day in the same way that an athlete an actor, an accountant, or anyone performs. And it is so critical that you accept this truth and as you've drawn over here on the wall, use that mirror to reflect constantly on your performance and find ways to improve it. And we'll talk a little bit about that today and I'll unpack that a whole idea of performance for you and leave you with some ideas or questions to think about. Sound okay? Yeah. All right, so shall we start with people? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this video and it goes for about five minutes. And on the video, I've, I've put up here the person's name and their sport. I, I, should, I, I know many of you will have questions later on. What did they do that make them great? <laughs> um, and I'm happy to answer those questions. And there will be some of you in the room that will say, she's not a great coach. He's not a great coach. That's cool. No problem. The way I use the word great is, if, somebody, if another coach has described them as great, one of their athletes has described them as great, or they've won a championship or a gold, or an Olympic gold medal. So I tend to use those three criteria to come up with the list. I've interviewed over 200 of them so far. All of them have given permission to film, but as you'll see, a lot of it's on Zoom. So it's not, this is not 
this is not, you know, studio quality, but like I said, I think the insights are absolutely timeless and universal. So that's what you'll see, and then as, after it ends, we'll take qu co uh, questions, and I'll talk to you how I've applied this learning in my life. All right, let me hit play. And you can't really influence somebody um, until you meet them where they are and then lead them from that point. You can't just get frustrated that they're not where you want them to be. You got to figure out where they are, why they are there, connect with them at that point, and then build up some equity to, to influence. Uh, don't let your ego get in the way of morphing to what the moment needs. Like sometimes our ego will get in the way. I don't have this problem. <laughs> I, I, maybe I did at an earlier age, uh, but I'm not, I, I, I try to meet people at their point of need, uh, which is also helping me. And I think that, uh, you know, that's, uh, a, a, as a coach, you, uh, you do all of that, but what you do is you stretch the people who are working with you. You challenge them and you take them to a place they didn't think they could be. But you still want to put that, you want to apply the amount of the right amount of pressure, but it's delicate. So it's like, okay, when and where and how and how much and how less. And so this is the constant battle that you're fighting as a coach because you care about the players and you care about their well being, but you also know that they have to be pushed to a certain point. Uh, to be them better, to be their better selves. So you, you're, you're actually trying to balance that all season. Um, Paul, for me, man management is um, such an important role in high performance sport. You know, we talk about culture and strategy. Um, building relationships and man management is as important as strategy. Because you don't want to spoon feed everybody because otherwise they don't know how to get through challenges and they're always going to look to someone higher up to, okay, um, so what do I do? You know, what am I supposed to do now? It's like, well, you need to work it out, you know. Working against people's sort of limiting beliefs about what they're capable of is quite a key part of our, our role. Now, some athletes come jam-packed with belief that they can do it, but my experience in the UK anyway is that's the... That's not the norm. The norm is, is full of self-doubt. But what I've learned actually is that the most powerful form of leadership is showing people love and showing them care. There's something they see in me that knows I care so much about them, not just as a basketball player. And if I can create that safe zone in our program, I get to push them to their limits in practice. I think, of course, love is a, is a big word. Uh, and, and I love to your children or your, or your partner uh, is, is different compared to love to your friends or, or your players or your, or your colleagues. Um, uh, because we all know that, they, that there need to be a lot of demands and there need to be some consequence. But I really, really believe you need to build that relationship with, with trust or love or what, what you call it. You need to, I think it's so important that you need to show you, you care about them, um, every single one of them. And I think that's the, the most difficult um, for me as a, as a head coach that, that they, I really hope that, that they, they, they feel and they see me as a person that they care about all of them. But, you know, I think everybody who really knows me and knows my career um, and, and, and that's been plentiful knows my relationship with Muhammad Ali. And Ali uh, used to tell me when I was, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, you know, he used to say the greatest religion of all is love and kindness. You can get people to do things if you show them love and respect. Hopefully you enjoyed that. It's a great, it's a great privilege, I think, to talk to some of these people. The last lady there is um, Nancy Lieberman. She, she played, she played, uh, she was also one of the, I think she was the second female to coach in the, um, in the NBA, but she played in the Lakers in the men's team way way back when when Pat Riley was was starting out she's very very amazing individual and she's uh, had was great friends with Muhammad Ali and talks a lot about that but anyway I digress so I'm going to talk to you a little bit what I've learned now along my journey so if you would had asked me prior to starting this little project back in 2020 Paul give us your top 10 leadership words care would not have made the list for me I've got to be honest just wouldn't 
It's not that I probably didn't think about it, and I don't think it's, I, I definitely think I was interested in people and I, I cared about them, but it was not a top 10 word. Um, but I can tell you now that care is at the top of that list, so much so that I would define my leadership identity as high care, high challenge. And it's because I think of, of what you heard Rick Charlesworth say. When, you, when someone knows you care about them, you can actually push them further than you could have ordinarily. You can actually ask more of them. And in my understanding, they will give you more. But you've got to put the care in place first. You can't just demand and challenge people. They're just going to lose interest. So this, this balance, you heard James Wade in there, the, um, the, American, the African-American guy talking about that balance. It's so true. And I've especially found that since I've come home to Australia. That bal I, mean, I do some executive coaching as well and I'm always talking to clients about that line. You push too far, then people push back on you. You don't push enough, you don't challenge people and get the most out of them. So that line is critical and you're all going to make a lot of mistakes around that line. Don't be afraid to make mistakes around finding it. You push people, you come back, you, you just have to apologise, reflect and move on. But finding that line is a challenge, particularly post-COVID. Many of you will work in different cultures. You'll go off and work in Asia and you might work in Europe and that line moves. It changes by the culture that you're in. And so you're always having to calibrate and, and prepare for that line. But it's, cri it's critical you understand on it and reflect on it. There's this idea which I had never heard of. Some of you may have heard of it. I hadn't until four years ago. It's this whole idea of meeting people where they are. I would have heard it a dozen times and then I, it becomes a pattern. I'm like, what does this actually mean? So the more I dug into it was, it's this idea of, well, who, who has a one-on-one -on -one with their boss at work? Is anyone working here? Okay. So in a one-on-one, -on -one, prior to starting this project, person would rock in and you might do it once a month for an hour and you'd say, hey, what's on your list? I've got five things. I got, you got five, I've got three on mine. We've got eight things to discuss in an hour. Let's go. Sound familiar? Past, post the podcast, I meet 45 minutes every week with each of my uh, reports. And I've got a big, I was just telling uh, Tess and, and Debbie, I've got a couch in my room now. I've moved all the, the two screens and moved them out. And I just flip the desk around so it's open. I put a couch in. Someone sits down and I say, how was your week? And then I just ask questions from there. And I ask questions not to help me understand, but to help them slightly raise their awareness around what's going on around them. Invariably, I have like to doist, I have a list of everything I want to talk. We always get to that list, but I never open it up and I never start there. So I begin with the person and I just simply ask them questions to, to see where we get. And on my, on my phone, I've got a little app, a flashcard app with about 60 plus questions that I'm very happy to share. I think I'm very happy to share them with you that I, before anyone comes in, I just quickly open it and flick. It's just 60 questions that just ground me in not talking or telling stories, but asking questions. So I'm always trying, I'm not perfect, but I'm always trying to ask those questions and just get better at them when people come in. I think there's this other thing here. You, 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 you heard a guy in there called Danny Kerry that coached the Amer uh, English women to a gold medal in field hockey talk about talking to people's mental state is an underappreciated element of coaching, is a hugely underappreciated element of leadership. Has anyone in the room had a chat with anyone in their team about um, their anxiety levels, yeah? How they're feeling at home, their mental health, it's, ch it's changing. So what that actually morphs into is um, you can ask about it, but then you've got to ask questions to raise their awareness. You can't simply be afraid to not talk about it. So a lot of what I think great coaches do really well, which we don't do in the corporate world, is they talk about mental skills. And there's, they break apart what the key mental skills are. Breathing, journaling, you know, um, talking with a performance coach. So bringing up your issues. Um, there's meditation, they have a range of them they talk about and they have mental skill, skills, teachers, coaches, routines that they go through. So I'll talk about that later on when we talk about your performance as a leader and how you're thinking about your mental skills. Um, and I think the last thing they do 
is they're not afraid to talk to you about your personal beliefs. So a lot of them will say, I'm like an amateur psychologist. And this is, I still struggle with this a bit. So talking to someone at work about their personal beliefs, I still find it difficult. But what I do speak to them about is the way they talk to themselves. So if I hear someone say, oh, that was a silly mistake. Or, God, I'm so dumb. Or I'm just really being forgetful this week. Whatever it is. If I hear someone make a negative comment to themselves, I stop them and I say, don't talk to yourself like that. A lot of people's inner voice is vicious and negative. And if you spoke to someone else the way that you speak to yourself, you'd be considered a bully. You think that's fair enough? Yeah. So, so what these people do is they actually are not afraid to talk to the people they're leading about their inner voice and how to reframe it. And I have tried to mold, fold some of that into the way I interact with people. It's difficult. But, like all things, if you're prepared to give it a go and fail along the way, you will build care. And the more care you build, back to where we started, the more you can challenge. So this is some of the things that I've learned around people at this, as my career's progressed, but at the same time as I've been speaking to these, these great coaches about leadership. So my question to you... Oh, oh I've got some questions for you now. I'm going to give you, oh, sorry, I've just, my team, someone's pinging me on Teams and it's popped up. <laughs> I've got some questions for you. So just, I'm just going to let you break, you, you know, it's 11 o'clock, you don't want to hear from me all day, so I'm going to give you five, six, seven, ten minutes. I've got two questions for you to discuss. You can either break your table in half any way you like. What's the role of the leader? I think that's, you'll all have a view. Set the vision. Set the standards. Role model the behaviours, set the strategy, empower people, the list is endless. <laughs> but I want to really get to this second point. What role does care play in your approach to leadership today? It may be zero, but that's okay. I want you to take some time to reflect on it. So I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll, I'll come back to you, okay? Over to you. Hopefully, hopefully there was some good conversation and it wasn't just around what's for lunch. We've got, four, we've got three more of those to go, so we'll keep, we'll keep building as we go and then at the end I'll give you that diagnostic where you can sort of reflect on, on how you're scoring in each of these areas so that at the end you'll, you'll walk away with something actionable. So let's, let's go to culture next, okay? So culture is this word, means many different things, but let's start by listening to the great coaches talk about it and then I'll explain to you what I think. All right, we'll start with Connor O'Shea, the, uh, the rugby coach. I think culture is more the environment you create and the environment you create is the people in it. And yes, you talk about values and all these other things, but it's creating an environment creates a culture. And I think that's what's changed my leadership the most is um, putting culture at the top of my list of my programs that I coach. And it doesn't mean that X's and O's and blocking and serving, all that's not super important. It just means we have to constantly spend time um, maintaining, building our culture. And if it's good, water the green spots and work on the brown spots. So every year uh, before I start a season, I, I get the players on and, and I talk about, okay, what's important for us to be the best team that we could be? and it's driven by the team. It's not, I'm not a dictator coach. I'm not, you know, we're going to do this, 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 because then I wouldn't have buy-in. It just doesn't work now. Maybe it worked many, many years ago, but it just doesn't work now. So it's more like, okay, what culture do we need? Um, what are the, what's important for us to be the best team that we could be? The culture can be created. You know, you can't, you don't have to leave it to chance. You can, if you want to, but I think it's culture can be created and sustained success can, can happen over a period of time. So our team wanted to come up with um, values or words that meant really meant something personal to us. So um, we have one of our words is uh, honest me. And honest me goes back to having those hard conversations. The girls just made that word up, by the way. 
So whenever we have hard conversations, it's about performance and about being accountable for your actions. So when we're having these discussions every day, we live that word. We speak that language every day. And what we do talk about in those situations, 15 and 0, 0 and 15, win or lose is, is, is the Alamo, right? And, and what is our Alamo, right? Where, where do we, after a game, where do we go back to? What do we fall back onto? Or what are our core values that we can fall back onto? And, you know, we're very specific in, 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 in what those are from, you know, from year to year. The team kind of establishes those. We have our own as a program. Well, I'll be back Tuesday in our first team meeting, our first culture pillars integrity. So I will walk in the meeting. Everybody will sit up with their notes out. I will say the word integrity and they'll scream back to me all at once. Win the day. That's really our main culture pillars to win the day. Just be the best we can be every day. So then I'm going to do a 10 to 15 minute presentation on what integrity means to me. Uh, we'll break up from that team meeting. Our special teams coordinator will speak on integrity. We'll break up into offense and defense. The offensive defense coordinator will speak on integrity. Uh, then we'll break into players position meetings and there'll be a player from each group speak on integrity. Then at the end of practice, another player will speak on integrity. We do that every day, the whole week. So then the next week we go to passion. So that's the second culture pillar. So I'll walk in the team room. I'll say passion. They'll scream back when the day. And, uh, I'll teach on passion for 10 or 15 minutes and then not to bore you, but we'll follow that exact same plan on passion. We work our way through every culture pillar. A, a huge part of being successful, I think, is understanding how to treat individuals uniquely within the environment. Now we call it the culture that I've created in my world. And if that culture um, is a good one, whatever that whatever that means good is, is a hard definition here it's going to have a role for every person the staff included so culture and environment get thrown around in sport all the time and in business i'm sure and people just think you just flick a switch and it just happens and everyone aligns it doesn't work like that you know it takes time it takes energy it takes commitment to keep reinforcing the key values that you want to make that kind of culture and to make that mindset and that, that environment and, and align, you know, a simple saying, but all knows this point in the right direction. And it, and it takes time. So hopefully, you, you know, you enjoyed that good cross section, I think of, of men and women talking about this idea of culture and it's much more important and spoken about in the sporting world versus the corporate world. And I have come to the conclusion it's because I think they define leadership differently. So I know you've got a, a definition up here on the wall and I'm sure there's some others. So I might, uh, I might confuse you by saying this, but I'll share it anyway. So I think if you think about the military, they would describe leadership as a version of completing the mission. Leadership is a mission-led activity to, to achieve a goal. I think if you asked someone in the corporate world, okay, I'll, I'll fill in for that person today, even though many of you are too, I think leadership is a version of allocating scarce resources to hit a strategic goal. So. I'm going to build a new factory. That factory is going to take five to seven years. It's got to be fit for products that are going to deliver for the next 20 to 25 years. So you're thinking long term. You've got there's scarce money. There's, there's, there's scarce materials. You need to allocate them accordingly. I think in politics, leadership is a version of influencing decision making through the political process. So working with stakeholders, aligning people, building consensus, I think that, that's part of it. And I think if you, what I've taken away from the great coaches is they think about leadership, and the, the sentence I've come up with is influencing others so that they can thrive. And influence they do through questions, through challenge, through pushing people. And thrive is an interesting word to me because it means, it means succeeding today but developing in a way that you're going to succeed in the future 
I mean, during the pandemic, there were lots of teams whose business, like the market share dropped or their sales dropped, didn't mean they weren't high performing because you'd go in a room with them and you'd dial into a Zoom and they were all interacting and asking the right questions and you knew that they were going to be prepared for whatever came next. But then sometimes you'll get together with a team who's, you know, having a great, they might have had a great marketing campaign or launched a great product, but you watch them interact and you think this team, you know, as soon as they're challenged, they're going to fall apart. So thrive to me is very interesting. So I think they think about leadership different, influencing people so that they can thrive. And if you're going to influence people, the culture is really important. The best tool I've found to analyse culture is the culture web. I can't remember the name of the... It's a quite a well-known tool. Um, I use it a lot at work with a new... Is it? Yeah. It's, you just search it and it comes up everywhere. If I've got a new employee into the team, I normally give them the culture web and I say, come back in eight weeks and tell me what you found. It's got things in there like what are the stories, the rituals, the power structures, uh, the hierarchies. It's got some, just some, some very simple stuff like that and then allows you to draw a conclusion of what the environment's like. But culture is a bigger priority for great sports coaches. You've heard them say it's more important than strategy or tactics. It's right at the top of their list. It's above everything else what they're aiming for because you get the environment right, you can influence people and they can move forward. So they talk about culture as being the environment that surrounds people. Um, I'm, I've been in this company five months. We're doing a, it's a business is in distress. It's losing money. It's been around for 60 years. It doesn't have a purpose. So Professor Debbie came and helped us with our purpose. Um, the culture there's, you know, there's inappropriate business practices, yada, 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 yada. But it doesn't matter. We're changing the culture and we're moving forward. And part of that moving forward now is thinking about the rituals, the symbols, the language, the power structures, the hierarchies. And so we spend time in our monthly board meeting reviewing how we're progressing in each of those areas. It's as important as reviewing the P&L. When you get underneath that culture, it comes back to values. And what's really interesting here is, and we're going to talk about values later on, is that each of you have your own values that are entirely personal to you and are very important and drive your behaviour. They might not necessarily be aligned with the organisation that you're in. They might not clash. If they clash, you normally find that you leave. But if you might find that you're very, you are all high performing individuals, passionate about learning, passionate about personal development, that might not necessarily be the, the values in your company. It might be conservative, it might be long term focused, it might not be all about innovation. And so you have to understand that as a leader, you have your own values, but you need to control them and also find a way to fit in with the values in the organisation. And a lot of young people, I know, bit sounding a bit cliched, but you know, a lot of young people I find come into work and want the company to recognise their values. My, my daughter goes to a school over in the north of Sydney and um, the tagline at the school is shine as you are. So everyone, right, everyone's allowed to shine as they are. It doesn't always work that way in the corporate world, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, our values, we've got, you know, one of our values is fair income, see it, fix it. You know, we're not, you know, it's different. You've got to, you've got to find this line I talked about earlier. You've got to fit in, but we also need to respect the individual. That line is really difficult and all of us are figuring that out as we go along. So they've got values, but I think what's more important is, uh, I think in the corporate world we talk a lot about values. In sporting world, they talk more about behaviours that are below the values. So how are you behaving today? And they spend a lot of time giving each other feedback. It's, it's, um, it's fascinating. My neighbour, strangely enough, used to captain the Wallabies. And I, over, you know, over the odd beer, I sort of ask him if this is true. And he's like, look, Wallabies, it was all about behaviours. You know, immediate, direct feedback on your behaviour in the last hour. You know, corporate world again different. We might do it at the end of the quarter. We might do it on the spot if it's really bad. Otherwise, it's not happening in real time. So behaviours is interesting too. And then you heard Sandy Brondello in there. She coaches the, the Australian basketball team. She also coaches, I think she's with the New York Liberty. I don't think she changed in the off season in America. She coaches in the WNBA. Um, she's won that championship a couple of times. 
she talked about regularly reviewing culture. And you heard um, Alan Knight, the volleyball coach, talk about it too. You know, watering the, the, watering the green spots, tending the brown spots. So they're just always talking about culture. It's a big, I don't know how many of you guys are talking about it in your monthly meeting. We've got it on our agenda now in our leadership meeting and it goes up in the board pack every month too. So we're talking about it all the time. So those are my learnings. So back to you again, another five to seven minutes. What drives culture in your organisation? Is it the managers in the business? Is it corporate head office? Or are you in a dysfunctional environment where, where people's influence is larger than their role? And does that drive the culture? Or does incentives drive culture? Are you in a really incentive heavy environment where there's a, you know, large financial incentives in place to drive culture. And then the second question is, how does that culture impact performance? Does it drive people to be individual superstars? Does it drive team behaviour? Does it drive long-term thinking, short-term thinking? What, what, what happens? So I'll throw that back to you. We're not going to debrief. It's just for your discussion as we head into the lunch break. And then I'll be back in, in about seven minutes. Does that sound okay? Yep. All right. Okay, all right, so just as we we're hit the halfway mark, you're, you're closer and closer to lunch at every minute. I'm going to talk about, the third thing I want to talk about is your performance as a leader. And I'm going to play the video, but I'm going to hit you between the eyes with something, all right? Your teams, your organisation, your families, whatever it is you're leading, that group will never be able to outperform the type of leadership you provide them. Fundamental truth. If you're only a 50-50 leader, you're only going to get 50-50 results. I can only find one example where this is not true, and that was the uh, Spanish soccer team in the World Cup that was in Sydney. You know, that, that horrible situation with the, that terrible coach that kissed the uh, player, that horrible, horrible situation. That's the only example I've been able to find of a team that was able to outperform its leadership. Yeah. On, the tr on the whole, your teams, in my experience, will never outperform the leadership you provide. So, you better spend some time thinking about it. You better find, spend some time thinking about what type of leadership leader you want to be. You better spend some time reflecting on it, confronting yourself and trying to be the best you can be because it will show itself in the results that, that your group, your family, your team, your community, whatever it is, what it achieves. But let's hear from some video and then, um, then I'll talk a little bit more. Well, I think in any profession, in any industry, your philosophy has to be first connecting with your purpose of why you're there. Uh, you're there for a reason. And I fully believe that in any situation, why am I here? What am I supposed to learn? How am I supposed to impact? Philosophy, I, I would, pride myself on saying that I'm holistic, being that golf is made up of technical, physical, mental, tactical and life skills outside of all of that. So there's the big, there's the big five. And uh, my, my philosophy, it's athlete centred, it's coach driven and it's a ministry supported. There's the four key areas in my opinion or my, my philosophy or is what I always focus on is to be a world-class boxer, you need to be mentally strong, physically strong, a good lifestyle, and technically and tactically developed. Now, as a club coach and as a young coach, you think you must do all this, but it's so much better when you, when you can avail of experts. And when you lead the program, get these experts in to help you lead the program and help everybody push in the right direction. But then later on, I had three boys. So my coaching philosophy is, is very simple. Uh, I, you know, players are not always going to love you. They're not always going to like you. Obviously, the guys you pick is going to like you more. But my coaching philosophy is more that uh, you have to handle players the way you want people to handle your kids. My core philosophy is not making people ever feel that they're the runt of the litter or um, they're anything other than valued. And they, you know, they've got to they've got to earn that value as well as I have as a, as a coach and they have as as an athlete or co-coach or whoever. Um, 
so that we can foster that environment. I would say that it's not said that there's other guys that are starting out on their coaching career, get your philosophy right, because that will define you as a coach. All of the decisions you make and what you achieve will come from your philosophy. And you need to be very careful. Don't let people take you away from that philosophy. Self-accountability. Um, the easiest thing for a coach to do is after a game is to go, you know, look at the stat sheet or look at video and say, hey, look, we didn't do this right, this right, this right, this right, this right. Um, the first thing I do after a game, whether we win or lose, is, okay, what could I have done better? Um, I, I look at myself first and foremost in, in the mirror um, when, we, uh, when we go back to the locker room. Um, before I go talk to the coaches, I say, okay, I, I didn't do this. I, I was bad at this tonight. I can do this uh, better. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, you've got to self-reflect as a coach. So that's a skill. And if you don't have a process for self-reflecting, then you're not going to grow your awareness around um, what you're doing as a coach or could you be doing things better. But you've got to be careful that self-reflection isn't ruminating. So you're not just sitting on things and overthinking things because that's not healthy either. Uh, as corny as it sounds, and as against it as I was at a young age, you got to have a philosophy. And I just thought that was something you did to get a job. I didn't know you really had to have a philosophy. Uh, but you better know who you are and what you're about. Because uh, you're going to think you're going to get in this thing and call all these great plays and it's just they're going to work. And it's it's the least important thing of all of it. It's funny, that guy, Jeff. He, has anyone seen Ted Lasso? Yeah. He's such a Ted Lasso. But <laughs> he's an amazing story. He started off as a high school basketball coach and history teacher making like 12,000 American dollars. And um, he just signed a $28 million contract. And he, and he said to me, he said, Paul, we've got three kids, have all left home. You know, I don't know what we're going to do with the money, but because he lives on campus and he, and he coaches on campus. He just had a long career to get there. But these American football coaches, you know, they get paid more than coaches in the NFL. They're, they're the, you know, they're getting paid 50, 60, 70 million. It's crazy. It's crazy. But anyway, so philosophy. So look, I have one. I sometimes call it a leadership identity. They call it their coaching philosophy. What is it? What's in there? They've got their two or three values. They're very clear on their values. They're very clear on the behaviours they have that support those values. And they're very clear where their behaviours can derail them. Does everyone in the, in the room know what their derailers are? Okay, so make a note, figure it out. What derails you? I can be too positive. Uh, I can be too optimistic and too positive. Um, and that can sometimes come across as toxic. Particularly, you know, when you're in a country and there's a war next door and you think it's going to be all right. So figure out what your derailers are. There's a Hogan, there's a Hogan test you can take online. You figure out what derails you. Another thing that derails me is if I work too long. If I work more than an eight or nine, nine hour day, I just completely lose interest. And my energy's gone and I can't roll up. So I have to, I'm, I'm in and out. I'm in and out the door. I don't mess around, but I'm any more than eight and a half hour day and I'm I'm not effective and then I become less effective as each day goes on. So, so I need to go to the gym, I need to do other things. So figure out what yours are. So you've got their values, you've got their behaviours. They then would understand what derails them and then they're able to wrap it into a sentence or a paragraph right, that describes them. So I talked to you earlier, Mine's my, um, my, my leadership identity is around high care, high challenge. And then I try to unpack the areas I'm going to challenge in. I don't, you know, as a CEO, and, and many, many of you that are managing teams will know this, if you ask 10 questions, and, you know, particularly when you work in Asia, if you ask 10 questions, you will get 10 answers. People will stay up all night to give you 10 answers the next day. It's not necessarily the case in Western Europe, um, but definitely I, I found working in Asia that you can, people really, the power distance in leadership is very, very long, and so people will give you every answer you need. So you've got to be really quest careful how many questions you want to ask. So if you're going to challenge, you know, I normally say, you know, every six months I'll, I'll say, where am I going to challenge this month? So right now at the minute our production, cap our operations ability is really limited. 
So you could probably accuse me of being a micromanager if you heard me asking questions all the way down to here. I don't do that in every area. All right, it's in, in specific areas. You can't do it everywhere. You've got to be very choiceful. And high care is really important, you know. So we've got about 80 employees, so I know everyone's name. I'm, I'm, I have a trick for memorising names, which I'm always using. And then I have a, a list, a cheat sheet. I keep their name of their partner and their kids as well. Um, interesting things about them. I try to listen and take it all in. Um, I talk about my own family a lot. I'm not afraid to do that. I'll put up pictures. Uh, I'll talk about what I'm doing on the weekend. I'm not afraid of that vulnerability. I think you've got to, that's part of care too. So they have this philosophy. And there's all different kinds I've collected. They all have different versions of that, but they have a very firm leadership identity. It's really interesting because this is the second time I'm watching these videos. Um, and this time I was looking at the backgrounds of a lot of these videos and a lot of them have trophies yeah. and the pictures of the people they love. So achievement and, co and care. And people, um, yeah. Mm. Mm. People's really important. People's, yeah, lots of trinkets. They have lots of trinkets, don't they? <laughs> they all have that, they are, every, this purpose thing's very powerful. Um, companies have a purpose, but individuals have a purpose. You know, Debbie can probably talk to us later on about the difference between a purpose and a mission. I think it's a very powerful idea. Oh, two hours of that, yes, Okay, all right. <laughs> I won't go into it again. But we, you know, so Debbie worked with us on, at Troy. So Troy, family owned animal healthcare business. We didn't have one got a group of people together, two and a half hours later we came out with enabling animals to thrive. So we make medicine for cats and dogs and pets and farm animals. Core beliefs, you heard about self-reflection routines. I don't know whether you're journaling. Um, I do. I'm a long time journaler. I highly, highly recommend it. Probably only do it two or three times a week. Um, it's, one, it's one of the core mental skills you'll hear the coaches talk about. whole life but invariably everything gets it's like a blender right <laughs> everything comes together but there's a I think sometimes when you when you say something out loud or you write it down it loses its power which is why I'm a fan of executive coaching um, you know I, I do a little bit I don't do a lot of it because I'm busy but I um, you know I offer it to a lot of people on my team too so just saying something out loud it loses its power it's, and I don't know about you everyone in the room but like you know you, you're all studying, you're working. If you catch up with your friends, it's probably the last thing you want to talk about is what's going on in your, cha your leadership challenges. You probably just, you know, you want to talk about the, you know, f just light things. So it's hard to find a space to reflect on what's going on, but you need to do it. They all talk about mentors. Who, who's got mentors in the room? Okay, so I would, I would, inc you sh I would. Inc I remember we talked about this last time I was here, Dr. Tess, I asked the same question. Um, it, both. You should, I think the, you should, uh, I would highly encourage, I've part of the Macquarie one now, I've picked up, um, I forget what it's called, the program. Lucy. Lucy, Lucy yeah. Now, I was just going to say we actually offer mentoring and coaching for free for our students, if that's something you're interested in, come and talk to us. I'm Grab it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I applied, like, they sent a note around, I said, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, you do, but I mean, it's great, it's both, isn't it? You learn both ways. I've got a, a, a lady, um, she's 28, 29, which is perfect, because it's outside of my bubble, and we have a coffee, and we chat about what's going on, and, you know, it's a two-way thing. But informal and formal, you know, I'd have, I'd have two formal that I ring every six to seven weeks, I sort of rotate it around. It's formal, I'm, I'm ringing them. I might be driving into work, it's 45 minutes. Hey, this, is, this chat's about what's going on. I want to talk to you about it. It's kind of like, yeah, no worries, let's talk. It's, I think you, the informal one's kind of like you catch up with an old colleague or a friend and you might say, hey, can we spend 10 minutes talking about this particular challenge I've got? And I want to think through it. But I, I would, you, you, you need to surround yourself with a, with a pit crew. You need people that will pick up the slack and will, will help you along. And it sometimes just gives you a little bit of confidence, you know, like, oh, I'm not sure what to do here. I'm, here are my options and you just solve it really quickly. So, you know, sometimes they talk about having your own personal board. I don't know if you've ever heard that talked about, but a lot of these uh, people will, will do it. Um, they will be in these groups, you know, where they Zoom in every month. Actually, I've been invited to a couple of them as an observer. And they'll just, you know, put on the table got this maverick player, he's disrupting the team, he's not, you know, blah, the usual stuff, 
you all know, you all know what those topics are. Because, and the reason you do it is you don't want to ruminate. It's like um, Sandy said, you know, when you, self-reflection's fine, but when it gets to you ruminating, it's taking too much mental space, stopping you from focusing on the family or at work, it's distracting you. So you've got to find that. That's why I think writing it down is good because you write it, you close the book, you move on. You have a mentor, you have a coffee, meeting's finished, you move on. It's when it gets stuck that it's really, it distracts you and it takes energy away and you lose your weekend and you lose a night's sleep and you're not as effective the next day. So ruminations is terrible. Um, and then they're all open about their self-reflection. So I, I talk about it at work. You know, I, um, I handwrite um, and I'll be handwriting and someone will, I have a, you know, like a, one of those things. A, a, an iPad, you know, and I write on it or reflect. There's something about handwriting and reflection I think is very powerful. Uh, so in a uh, staff meeting uh, or a town hall meeting, I might say, you know, I might say I was just reflecting on um, the great reset day we had and as I was driving home and some of the things I thought were. So I'm not afraid to talk about the fact that I'll self-reflect. Or I might say, um, you, know, uh, you know, last week I, I, I walked... I did a walk around the big block we've got outside for half an hour and I just, I went away and I was reflecting on, insert whatever the issue was. So talking about it gives other people permission to do it. So I think it can work quite well. Enough from me, another seven minutes. Um, seven minutes for a pretty big topic. Uh, just to have a discussion around your leadership identity. Have you got one? Maybe you haven't written it down but you've started to think about it. So anyway, over to you. What's how would you describe your leadership identity? Just one to go and then we'll do, a, we'll do the diagnostic and we'll see, uh, we'll see how your leadership style compares, all right? So let's talk about learning. Given we're all, uh, we're all here today on this beautiful Saturday, let's talk about learning. So I'll put on, um, it kicks off with Brenda again, which is interesting. Here we go. Well, I think the great coaches um, are lifelong learners. You'll hear that a lot, but I think they're evaluating themselves constantly and pursuing their craft constantly. Which is, I think the great coaches uh, are, are eager to learn. They aren't just lifelong learners. I think that's, a, that's an easy answer. They're eager to learn. I feel they have the real courage of their own convictions. Um, and they hold their position strongly, but also possibly with a, a, an element of curiosity for, for other views. I think the number one thing is, you, I think you, as, to be a great coach, I think you need to be open to new ideas. And you also have, you have to keep, keep being prepared to rebuilding. I mean, the thing is what, you, you know, what you've done in the last two years, somebody else is gonna be doing that. And you, gotta, you have to be creative and you have to be always trying to look for ways to go, to go forward in, in your programs and your messaging and your co consistency. And I think the other thing that I see in great coaches that I've met is they're really curious. So they're, they're really interested in, in asking questions and they treat people around them that they meet just as much as an expert as what they are. So they're always learning and curious about what it is that they could do differently to, to keep improving and being better. There's one, there's a commitment to the individual development of every person slash player slash staff in your organization. And what happens, we have these pockets of commitment to player development. We have these pockets of commitment to sending a staff off to a seminar to get better. That needs to be second nature and in your DNA. That needs to be a formula for getting better because we abandon them, then we come back to them when we need them. And I think, uh, you know, specifically about a basketball team, it's so, so simple. We committed just 20 minutes every day to the individual, truly individual development of each player. But I think in general, people at the top of their professions are not afraid to try something because that's a chance. It's a huge opportunity. I don't see it as a risk. I see it as an opportunity. This is not something I do like, okay, every month I do X, Y, and Z. Like this is a lifestyle choice to constantly be learning, 
ask more questions, give less answers, um, to have a humility of, of what can I learn from the person to my right or to my left, really, uh, it, despite any titles or anything else, to just make the lifestyle choice to be a consummate learner. But I'm, I'm still on my learning continuing life. The learning continuing of life for me is each and every day. Can you do something better today than you did yesterday? Can you help someone a little bit better today than you did yesterday? Can you influence someone today that needs some influencing for, the, for their own benefit? So it's an everyday thing for me. To, to, you, you, you've got to want to learn faster and, and to, to learn better. And it, it's not just that you want that in your, your, your players, you've actually got to be pretty hot at that your, yourself. And that relates to coaches too. Yeah, you've got, to, you've got to keep thinking about, right, how can I evolve myself as a coach? How can I keep getting better as a coach? And, and unless you do that, you are going to die. If you're not evolving, then you're not getting better. And then you're not doing the very thing you ask your student athletes to do. Such a powerful uh, idea to finish with, isn't it? I mean, so there, let's get this on the table. These people are obsessive. <laughs> I actually wouldn't, if I had, I don't have their level of, of obsession, I'd burn out. So they work way too many hours. They all talk about it. They're obsessed and they're obsessed about learning to give themselves an edge. So curiosity drives their learning desire and they're really uncomfortable being comfortable. So I don't think I necessarily want to embrace their level of obsessiveness, but I do think this idea of a personal development plan and learning and always moving forward is something that drops off in the corporate world. Right? Not everybody is as passionate about learning. Although many of us will listen to a podcast, we'll read a book, we'll read an article. So there is some degree of curiosity there, but it's way more ingrained in this group. And in fact, I would say on the whole, many of the CEOs and, and directors I've worked with, they're so busy, they just stop learning. And I think it's kind of understandable because they'll say, well, everything I did beforehand got me to this position so if I keep doing that I'll keep succeeding so they get sort of stuck in that that little that loop I think I think it's one of the great ideas being an expat because you get thrown into a new environment you've got to figure it out it's totally different you've got to learn a language a culture a new route to market you've got to learn a new consumer a new regulatory code there's a whole pile of things you need to you're forced to learn so they're driven by curiosity they're very open to new ideas they're very obsessive one idea I have taken away from them in this space, which I have found quite useful is, there's often times at home, I have two teenage daughters or at work where people are, um, you know, they might be crying, and this is men and women, this is not, you know, this is everybody. They're crying because they are feeling nervous, out of their depth, a little bit. They might use the word stressed, I think they might be using that. I think we can have a discussion around what stress really is. What they're really feeling is challenged. And what I've started to do is reframe that as what you're experiencing right now is a growing pain. It's not the physical growing pain we had when we were younger. It's an emotional or an intellectual growing pain. And I've had, I've had some success with reframing that for people. These tears, this lack of sleep this, that you're feeling is a growing pain. And on the other side of it, you're going to be a little stronger in the area you might have been less strong before. And I've taken that from this idea of being uncomfortable with comfort. Sort of, and sort of, if you think about it, as an athlete, you're constantly stressing your body and being uncomfortable in the service of a goal you've set yourself. So discomfort shows you that you're moving forward and you're getting stronger. So they have that more uh, uh, physical connection with discomfort and the link to learning. So they're very much into this, this learning idea and this learning space. So I would, would ask you this question, but I'm gonna skip through it because you're an MBA class. I think asking you about your learning routines right now is a little bit, <laughs> probably a little bit silly, right? You're all reading and studying and trying really hard to learn. So I'm gonna pop over it. And what I'm gonna do instead is 
I'm going to take you to this, this leadership survey. So I'm going to put a QR code up. You can do it on your phone. It takes three or four minutes. Have a look at your results and then we'll just finish with 10, 15 minutes of Q&A. So what I did was I took, um, I took all of the questions. When it came home to Australia, I didn't go back into corporate work straight away. Um, you know, I did a bit of everything. did some advisory work, some coaching. I did my podcast. I lost my beer belly. Uh -huh. I had a lot of fun. And one of the things I did was I have a database. So all of the little videos you've seen there, I've cut them. They're in, they're in a database of about 2,000 now and they're all searchable by keyword and topic. So I, I was able to sort of sift through them over the couple of months and I tried to create a survey or a set of questions that could be used in each of those. I did five questions for each of the four areas. So you could try to get a feel for how, oh, well, I was doing it for myself, how I was relative to those areas. So what you'll see next is those, those areas. Um, takes about five to ten minutes. You just, I'm not the end, on the screen will just pop up a little, you'll get a little spider web, you versus the average of everyone that's taken it. There's no right or wrong answer, it. you'll just see some gaps versus the average or where you're under or over. And then we'll, we'll have a bit of a talk about it. So there's the code. I'm going to cross my fingers it worked. Uh, I haven't tested it for a couple of weeks, so hopefully it's still working. Yeah. It's all good? Yeah. All right. I don't think you have to leave your name or anything, it's totally anonymous, so just have a go and I'll come back in a few minutes when you're finished and we can have a chit chat. Um, your chance to, I don't know, tell me what you think, ask any questions, give me some feedback. I'm not going anywhere, we've got lunch next, it's not quite ready, so we might as well use the time. Um, anyone brave enough to start? I'll let you go. So you can look at it in two ways. You can say, well, how are you versus the top score? So you can see that's the full score. Okay. Or you can go down and have a look versus the average below. Yeah. So you can see. There's no right or wrong. You just find some little gaps. I mean, you're all leaders anyway, right? So the people that take the, the survey tend to be good leaders or in the leadership game. Um, if you get a top, if you get to 35, you'll have a full score. Yeah. Okay. So, any any questions, thoughts, feedback uh, before we break? No, it is. There's no, there's no right or wrong approach, right? I mean, listening to you, I'm I'm reminded of this idea of. Um, you know, the quest for perfection it just doesn't exist. <laughs> right, so I mean like, you know, every day something will go wrong, there will be an underperformance, a gap. And so self-reflection helps you to think about it, find a way to improve, close the book. <laughs> so you can get to the next day. And I think this idea of 80% today is better than 100% tomorrow is very powerful. And self-reflection can help you bring that into your mind and the people you're leading. Um, if you've got people in your group that are real perfectionists, it's really difficult because they won't show you something until it's 100% right. They'll get racked with anxiety and grief and we lose that whole speed thing. So just listening to you, I'm, that's, that's what comes through my mind, that reflection will help you deal with imperfection and just prepare and keep moving forward. Absolutely. And celebrate it because you only just keep... It's the only, every day there will be challenges and things that go wrong and ethical, I mean, we didn't even talk about ethical challenges, I'll stand up, sorry. We didn't even talk about ethical challenges today, but the ethical challenges you will face. I mean, these, I, I often ask them and it's about drugs in sport or cheating, but the ethical challenges that you're going to face, I mean, many of you are from countries small over the world and ethics changes dramatically. What one country considers to be a non-ethical practice is standard practice in another. So you have, to, you have to shift and find a way forward and it's never black and white. It's never black and white. It's always grey and, and that's why there's no algorithm. Every day you've got to evaluate it on its merits. What, like, what are the top, how do you decide what to reflect on and what not to reflect 
I think you need to, this is a really good question for a mentor, like if you can get someone and have a coffee once a month and it's a, it's a great co coffee conversation, isn't it? I, I work with a person, I was working with a person that asked me something similar not long ago and we came up with um, doorknobs, you know, a door handle. And what we would say is every time before the person touched a door handle, they would try to think, what does, what does the next moment require of me? So if you're going into a room, or you're, I mean, obviously not if you're walking to the toilet. <laughs> but, you know, if you're walking into a meeting or you're walking home or perhaps you're going into your son or daughter's room, that door, we sort of worked on that because it's your hands, it's touching, and we'd like, just that, what is this moment? It's a micro-reflection. That was very helpful for that person. For others, I, I quite like, I, I block the last hour of my day and I will clean a little bit of email and I might stare out the window for three minutes and just think about something and move on. So I think you've got to find blocks and routines that will help you. Don't scroll. Don't, yeah, don't scroll. I mean, you, you might go to the bathroom. Don't take your phone. <laughs> you, you just, you just, you, I mean, you can just mindlessly scroll or you can reflect for 90 seconds, whatever you, you choose to do. You, you, you've got to find a routine that works for you. There's a, there's a couple of great apps. There's a great app I've got, I, don't, I can't remember the name of it, that gives you prompts. You just click on it and it'll just give you a prompt. Here's a question to think about. So there's, there's plenty of tools I think you can find. Day one, yeah. yeah. There's, a few, there's a few out there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I feel like my mind is cutting like so fast and you know, I don't have patience to write it out. But that's why handwriting's that's why handwriting's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> it's just the connection between hand there's a, I've I've read um, some studies, I don't know how academic they are, from Dr. Jim Leher, who's a famous performance psychologist, and he's done some work between long term memory and the use of hands and he thinks that there's a connection there. Yeah. So I prefer handwriting. I think it's a slow process. I like vinyl records too because they're slow. Um, but I think there's, no I don't, I mean I might write, no I'm not, it's, it's more like journalism, you know, went, did this, thought this, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not like bullet points. yeah, I don't really bullet point, but they're not, they're not deep reflective thought. <laughs> it's just quickly moving through, um, reflecting on it, talking about it. Um, I also use an iPad, so I'll take a picture, if I'm in a a review or something, I'll take a picture, it goes into the iPad and then I might scribble a note. So it's sort of, it's a bit multimedia-ish like that. Just to follow up on that point and, and the idea of reflection, not rumination, I think that is a yeah. tricky line. Mm. But then, do you then spend a bit more time on the stuff that you think is going to sit there and bother you? That's more coaching. So, right. so yeah, I would probably take that into, I mean, everyone's got coaching topics. And they can sh shift around, right? So you might say, okay, um, I'm going to do six sessions and the six sessions are going to be focused on my career plan. That's, a, that's an easy one. Or um, I want to get better at uh, engaging at board level. You know, it might be something like that. So you could take that six. It's like a defined project. I'm going to do six sessions over. It might take four or five months. So I would handle that that way. I think what sports coaches do really well, which we kind of do okay in the corporate world is, so they'll finish a game and then they'll say, I've got 24 hours to that game's over and then I go to the next one. So they'll do their review, they'll talk about it, close the door and they move on. Tiger Woods has got this 10 step rule. So he'll say 10 steps after a bad shot and then he's, he's, he moves on. And I think the, the, monthly, the monthly board meeting is always good because you do, you do, so in our instance, we do the safety scorecard, the quality scorecard, we do all the numbers, we do overheads, and then we do one or two special projects, 45 minutes, take the minutes, it's done, you move on. So I, I like that idea of that routine of, you know, somehow closing it and moving on. I think it's quite... So that's kind of a master's degree. Yeah. 
Actually, you know, the other thing I extend it to when people leave the company, because then there's, they can leave a shadow or a linger. So I always try to have a morning tea or an event, even if they've been made redundant, where we say thank you. This is going to sound really odd, but uh, this business I'm in at the minute has been through a lot of change. They had redundancies before I got there and they never had any farewell for them. Uh, Pr Professor Debbie's been there, so she has a little bit of a feel. Oh, okay. Um, and I actually did, we did another round, my first round, and I, it was six of them. And we had a night at the, it was uh, all from sales, we had a night at the pub, and I thanked them. And then I said, we'd like your permission to carry on what you've started. And they said, yep, go for it, that's great. And I just thought that was a nice way of tying that off. And now we won't think about it and we'll move on. So, I don't know, it might sound a bit strange, but I'm always looking for a, route, a way to close it, move on, close it, move on, close it, move on. What do we learn, move on? Especially with new products, it's easier. So, okay, that one failed. Can someone type up what we learned? We'll f move on. So, a lot of us, we, we don't have, I mean, I don't know how many of you have institutional tools where you can put the, learnings we've just bought one called Viva so everything's will now get filed so you know your, your new product development you do your review 12 months afterwards you get your learning you put it up there you buy a new piece of capital equipment you commission it it doesn't work you try to capture your learnings so we're trying to capture them put them in there it's a bit harder because it's within the individual um, but you do need you do I don't know how many of you have tried this and said to your team can you guys come back and present to me what we learned about this you might get a few bullet points and then you've got to reject it, right? And you go, no, no, we spent a million bucks on this. So I want to, guys, go away, have a cup of tea over 45 minutes and come back and tell me what we learned. Still not quite there. I'm really not sure if you thought about one, two and three. Please reflect on that, you know. It's easy not to do that. Yeah, like I'm trying to work out. Ah, the trophies are not going to, tr trophies are just a moment in time. They're just a moment. I mean, I've got a quote. I didn't use it today. It's one of the best ones. It comes from, um, oh, sorry, it, it, her name just escapes me. But she finishes by saying, um, best piece of advice she got was, don't get so busy focusing on shiny trophies that you forget about the living trophies. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, hit, hit you right between the eyes type of thing. You know. I think it's the same sort of thing. Get focused on your end of year incentive and you miss the learning, and therefore you're just starting again from fresh the next year. Anything else? All right. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I get great energy from this, and I, I love coming along and spending time with you. Uh, I'm gonna hang around for, for a little bit, so if you've got any questions, come up and say hello. Thank you. Thank you.